John, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a great friend of mine who's a, an ambassador um, had to serve for many years in a particularly disagreeable post where uh, alcohol was certainly frowned on and sometimes banned and where the sun always shone. I won't say any more than that uh, <laughs> in case we get any benefactions from them. Um, and after doing four years uh, in the sand, he was offered a post um, in a very agreeable Western European watering hole. And I asked him how he felt about leaving his present country. And he said he had two emotions. He said, uh, relief and rapture. <laughs> and for everyone who is passionate about Rhodes and Oxford and the training of leaders for the future, today has plainly been a day for rapture. Thanks to uh, John and Marcy and what uh, I believe, and I have the authority of the Canadian Prime Minister to say it, the largest educational benefaction ever made by a Canadian. I was um, just Chancellor when the hundredth, when the centenary celebrations were held with a great meeting in Westminster Hall, at which we uh, heard a terrific speech from President Clinton, at which we witnessed a wonderful speech by Nelson Mandela, uh, and at which we also had a speech from the then British Prime Minister. Uh, I'm delighted to have survived to the 110th birthday. I obviously have the aspiration to be here for the 120th. But since, uh, at my age, I start to feel increasingly goosed by time's winged chariot, I don't think I should go beyond that without risking impertinence to the Almighty. So um, we know that there will be Rhodes scholars then, and Rhodes will be thriving, not least thanks to John. Um, but uh, um, I'm just hoping. Um, near the heart of the Rhodes success has, of course, been the relationship between the Commonwealth, and particularly today, I can say, uh, Canada, um, the United States, and Britain. Um, others as well, but that's, I think, been the um, principal um, mortar. Uh, the Commonwealth, uh, somebody once said, actually, it was a former Rhodes scholar, in the Commonwealth, all roads lead to Washington. <laughs> What's perhaps a bit surprising to some people about the uh, the relationship between the United States and Britain is that is the paradox that we're both countries which combine uh, a very extrovert international posture with the introversion of a billiard ball. Uh, it was uh, Cecil Rhodes who said um, that the English have won the first prize in the lottery of life. Um, Rudyard Kipling, who said, uh, uh, everyone like us is we and all the rest are they. <laughs> and as for America, um, you may know the English novelist Julian Barnes, who once said that if you want to see your own country disappear, you go to America and open a newspaper. <laughs> Um, something that's always puzzled me is why it is 
that the premier sporting event in America, to which nobody else is invited, is called the World Series. That's always, <laughs> <laughs> that's always been a big puzzle as far as I'm uh, concerned. But despite that, um, these are countries which have been at the heart of liberal internationalism and the construction of the uh, infrastructure of the institutions which have made it possible. Um, it's been uh, Rhodes Scholars who've so often been in the front line of trying to prevent and avoid global catastrophe or have found themselves uh, trying to uh, repair the damage done by those catastrophes which no one could avoid. A, a former Rhodes Scholar, Joe Nye, um, has written extensively, I don't think he'd mind me saying several books, um, on the th theme of soft power, the notion that power isn't something you just find down the barrel of a gun uh, or on the tip of a rocket, but power comes as well with the way you can influence others through your values and through the way in which you serve those values. And if you want a very good idea of soft power, you just have to look down the list of former Rhodes scholars. I did so the other day, um, I Wikipedia'd it, which is, as you know, the New Testament of the digital age. <laughs> and it is a, a quite astonishing list of people who in every sector, every walk of life, church, academic, politics, public service, um, law, charitable work, health, environment, right across the board, people who have made the world a better place. I think it's a list which would have um, astonished even Cecil Rhodes. And there are two things, finally, I just want to say about that astonishing achievement over the last century. First of all, I want to thank all those who've supported Rhodes and have made the trust and the selection of scholars work. And I particularly want to uh, underline that point about selection. Um, it's well known that no great man or woman would ever survive an interview with the personnel department. But somehow, you've managed to make the most astonishingly successful choices um, over the years. And I want to thank everybody who's been involved in that. Secondly, I just reflect on the continuing relevance of the objective set out in Cecil Rhodes' will. Not just scholarly attainment, but actually um, the encouragement of people to use their talents to the full, uh, the idea of public service, the uh, argument that we should be generous to underdogs, and a real sense of moral leadership. We've seen that developed and extended in the last few years with the Mandela Rhodes uh, Foundation, uh, which has uh, already seen its um, endowment double uh, in uh, less than 10 years. So I believe that you will be going on, not least thanks to the um, McCormick Bain Foundation I think you'll be, in the next few years, um, helping to provide the leaders for coping with the problems of the 21st century. Um, the former master of Trinity College at Cambridge, the, uh, we've got a Trinity College here as well, actually. <laughs> It's next to an extremely good college, isn't it? <laughs> no, Harold Macmillan used to say that the great thing about being chancellor 
was that you discovered there were other colleges in the university. <laughs> and he used to go on to say, in a speech which I heard several times, um, but you know, if it's Placido Domingo, you don't object to hearing Nessum Dorma for the 13th time. He used to go on to say, the great, the wonderful college next door, he's over the most beautiful garden. Um, Martin Rees, who was master of um, Trinity, um, used to, uh, uh, or wrote a book a few years ago called The Final Century. And when he wrote the manuscript, he put a question mark after The Final Century. Um, the publishers left out the question mark. When it was published in the United States, uh, it was entitled The Final Hour. <laughs> and the burden of his argument was he thought there was only a 50-50 chance of us surviving this century. Well, I don't think anybody who's been a Rhodes Scholar um, would be satisfied with that. And I think generations of Rhodes Scholars will work to improve the odds. Uh, Kant, um, this is just thrown in for all former PPE scholars, <laughs> said that there were three important questions in life. First of all, what can I do? Secondly, what ought I to do? Thirdly, what should I hope for? Well, Rhodes scholars over the years have made it clear what we can do. They've also had a deep sense of what we ought to do. And because of that, I think what we can hope for is uh, a more civilized future than would otherwise be the case. And I want finally to say that we owe in the certain achievement of that so much to John and Marcy for making that possible and for giving Rhodes another century and more. Uh, my own college celebrates next week its 750th birthday for about the 13th time. <laughs> uh, I thought we did that when I was an undergraduate, but maybe I was wrong. And I'm sure that one day, thanks to John and Marcy, um, Rhodes will be celebrating its 750th birthday. Thank you all very much indeed.